<clears throat> this has been very interesting to be at this conference and this is uh this what i'm presenting is an update of a paper i presented at brookings in the spring of 2021 and and that paper was really kind of a high level analysis of two questions how does behavior impact the dynamics of a pandemic and then how does it impact our options for mitigating the impact of a pandemic on public health and i i did that a year ago with a quantitative model of the dynamics of covid in the us at a very aggregate level um and so i've updated that now for developments in 2022 and that has changed a bunch of the answers i'll discuss that so just you know for economists <laughs> Uh, this is known to all the epidemiologists, but the, you know, the dynamics of a simple SIR model without behavior are very much driven by this basic reproduction number and the generation time. And so the basic reproduction number tells you the height of the peak and the fraction of the population, the minimum fraction of the population infected in the long run. Uh, but the, you know, those predictions that came out in March of 2020 with a very high level of deaths, you know, were just driven by, this is a simulation of the model that I have without behavior, and it predicted an early peak of over 30,000 deaths a day in the blue line, and then actually, you know, Delta and Omicron show up later. But the red line is what actually happened. So you see that those early models were off by at least an order of magnitude in the um uh, in the level of deaths but there is some question about whether their long-run predictions for mortality were kind of on the mark or not so let me just show you before i get into the details of the model this blue line now is the model that i have with a very simple reduced form behavioral response to daily deaths in the u.s and the red line is the seven day uh moving average of uh, daily deaths coming from the CDC. So I, you know, I was very happy that this, this seemed like a baseline from which I could then do counterfactuals to ask certain questions. Of course, I will say as a weakness of it, um, it's unclear whether this was just great good luck that the model fits so well, uh, or whether, uh, you know, it's, it, there's actually something systematic going on a year ago, I had fit a model of this kind to the UK. Uh, I haven't done a lot of work to try to update it, but you can see that um, the, the fit in the UK at my first pass deteriorated substantially with mysteries being why did deaths decline so fast in the spring and why did they not come up higher uh, in the fall of, of, of 2021 in the UK. So maybe some people have ideas about what's going on here. But to get into the weeds a little bit, let me just give you two slides on what's in the model. So it's a SEIR model uh, with a reduced form behavioral response of the transmission rate to daily deaths that I'll talk about more on the next slide. That uh, transmission rate beta IT will depend on, four, you know, there'll be four variants in the model. Uh, it's very important to have seasonality and transmission to fit the data. Uh, I do take a guess at the rate at which Omicron can infect those who, who have had prior immunity from vaccines or prior infection. Um, but probably the most important thing that came up <clears throat> getting the model to fit was to have a delay between infections and deaths. So behavior responds to deaths, but mechanically with a lag because it takes people time to go from being infected to die. And uh, what that does is gives you oscillatory dynamics that are really important in getting like the summer wave here in the US in, in uh, 2020 and, and some of the other oscillatory dynamics. Uh, my first attempts to do a behavioral model of this kind where you responded to infections was the model was just over-controlled. Uh, now I admit that the Bayesian decision-making foundations of having a delayed response are very much <laughs> uh, ad hoc, and that's something I think to work on, uh, but uh, that delay is something that turned out to be quite important. Um, 
So let me just get into the details of, of how behavior is modeled as impacting transmission. Uh, I have this reduced form equation for each variant of what the transmission rate is at a point in time, um, with the parameters being there's an inherent transmissibility parameter, beta bar i. Uh, this psi t is just a cosine wave that gives a seasonal in transmission. Uh, d dot t is the daily deaths implied by the model. And then kappa t is the strength of the behavior response to daily deaths. Um, and I'll show you a picture of, of what that looks like. I don't have a single parameter, but I essentially have, have two. There's a, there's a one-time change in behavior, but then otherwise there seems to be a pretty consistent behavioral response. And I mentioned that the oscillatory dynamics are, are, are really important in, in allowing for the fluctuations that we've seen. So the this parameter kappa t is like a semi-elasticity of how much uh, transmission response, the level of daily deaths. And what I'm using in the model, and this was you know fit by I, was initially through into the fall of 2020, there was a very strong response or very strong semi-elasticity. And then that fell quite rapidly to 35% of its initial value. And then I've just kept it constant for the remainder of time. So I'm getting uh, a constant you know, semi-elasticity here that does the experience uh, over the last year. Um, uh, so one of the things I asked earlier about the evidence this is behavior responding to cases or deaths uh i thought in this model omicron was kind of a nice experiment uh in that what this graph is showing is is the um time path of active infections or how many people are in the eye compartment by variant so uh this is the uh i think i must have must have mess something up here but this is the initial variant this one is delta and then omicron just takes off so it's uh uh by having people react to deaths and omicron being the only one with a lower infection fatality rate the model naturally gives uh much more widespread transmission of omicron despite having the same behavioral parameter kappa t so that you know, it's like a correlation or suggestive evidence that that behavior is responding to danger rather than infections. Mm -hmm. Now, when I got to the when I did the Brookings paper a year ago and thought about immunity being permanent, this is something that's come up before. But then I could ask, you know, if you didn't have vaccines coming along, if you have behavior responding to the prevalence of the disease, then you have the behavior response returns to pre-pandemic norms when deaths drop to zero. And so basically the, the pandemic can't end until you know, you've depleted enough susceptibles to get right past the herd immunity threshold. Uh, at the levels of infection that we're taking as a baseline, there really isn't you know, much overshooting of the herd immunity threshold. So basically, a year ago, I got a very stark result that if we didn't have vaccines, basically strengthening the behavioral response or doing temporary mitigation didn't do anything at all to cumulative deaths if the infection fatality rate is constant because it doesn't change the portion of the population that's infected. But now that I'm getting, you know, with, with waning immunity, which I needed to put in the model to match the data, you know, the end game is different. Stronger mitigation or a stronger behavioral response will reduce deaths in an endemic steady state. And then, of course, there's the fact that Omicron itself is a bit like a vaccine with its lower infection fatality rate. So delaying infections until Omicron arrives does also have a benefit. So, you know, this is one prediction of the model that got muddied once we considered you know, the combination of Omicron and, and waning uh, uh, immunity. And so this is a picture of, you know, what 
the daily path of deaths would have looked like in a counterfactual without vaccines. And I made a table here of, you know, using the baseline behavioral response, uh, the cumulative deaths uh, that you get in two and a half years and in five years, and then doing it again with a, a kappa twice its level at all times or half as strong. And so, you know, you're getting behaviors having uh, a substantial impact after two and a half years. And of course, it's kind of fictional to consider five years because who knows what will happen with other variants. But, you know, you have an order of 10 to 20 percent impact on cumulative deaths over five years. So that was kind of the order of magnitude I was getting from how many lives you could save with, with stronger, essentially temporary uh, mitigation. Um, and a year ago, I was able to say that if if you did have vaccines coming and the vaccines conferred permanent immunity, then there was really a strong incentive to slow down the pandemic until the vaccine arrives and you got a very large payoff then to having a stronger behavioral response because you're basically pushing infections and deaths you know, to the point where instead of people gaining immunity through infection, they gain it through vaccines. And unfortunately, if immunity wanes um, from vaccines, then uh, that's, that effect is not as powerful. And so I'm getting that a stronger behavioral response in advance of vaccines is less effective in reducing cumulative deaths. So I run the model, you know, with the vaccines and you know the the cumulative deaths in two and a half years the, the model is very good at cumulative deaths through the first two years of the pandemic and we're at like nine hundred and thirty thousand something in the cdc data uh so it's it, it's predicting not many more in the you know until mid-august of 2022 and really not many more in the endemic steady state predicted by the model over five years um and then if you made kappa twice as strong you get a bigger percentage change in deaths. And you see though that, you know, the lion's share of lives saved is coming from vaccines. If we compare the previous table with this one, with any level of, uh, of behavior. But, you know, now there's a case to be made for maintaining a stronger behavioral response, even with vaccines uh, in that it could, you know, continue to save lives. So it's, I guess the update after a year is thinking about the big picture of what are the options for policy on top of, you know, a behavioral response to change long run outcomes, you know, is really dependent on what your end game is. And I guess something I didn't emphasize, my behavioral response is completely reduced form. So it is the combination of private, of baseline private and public or policy responses. Uh, and so when I'm con contemplating it, making it twice as strong or half as strong, I have to be thinking of politicians or policymakers uh, overcoming the political constraints that they have in, in uh, uh, imposing uh, stronger public policy responses. Okay, now in terms of, you know, forecasting and in terms of thinking about how should we go forward with policy, it does seem that the big risk is that we would get a variant that is like Omicron in terms of evading immunity, but perhaps is more deadly. And when people talk about forecasting, I was using this model in very early in December, the first week of December, to talk to people at the Federal Reserve about what Omicron, the data in South Africa and Omicron might mean. And at that time, I wasn't aware that there were good estimates at a lower infection fatality rate. So when I stuck it in with the infection fatality rate of Delta, I was writing, you know, this is fantastically bad news uh, and perhaps bad news for the economy. Uh, so I do think there's this question of, you know, even in the near term over the course of the next year or so, uh, what do we need to do to get ready if something like this uh, were to occur? 
So I think I've fitted into the time scale, I hope, and we can go to a general discussion. Thanks, Andrew. You, you have you have a few minutes more if you if you'd like to have that. No, no, no. no. I think I think that's fine. I, I I prefer to have kind of a conversation about these things. Okay. And uh, see what happens. Wonderful. Okay. In that case, uh, let's switch and uh, and open the floor to general discussion.